Okay, so uh, first of all, so the source that I use is I really like these books. I got Long War, but Long War, IRA, and Fighting for Ireland. I found that if you're interested, uh, Long War and Fighting for Ireland are really interesting, really good books. IRA, good, but pretty dry. And also I found that for some of the earlier information, um, Simon Shama's History of Britain is a pretty good source. Um, so first off, I'm going to give a background, another historical background. I'm not going to go too much about it. I'm not going to do like a whole history of Ireland, but you really can't talk about the Irish Republican Army without talking about Ireland, the history, and kind of what led up to it. So I'll just try to skim as much through it as possible without, you know, sacrificing content. And also before I start, let me talk about the Irish Republican Army. It's sort of a misnomer. It's not the Irish Republican Army, more like the Irish Republican Armies, because there are definitely multiple ones. You have, for instance, the what's now known as the old IRA, at the time just the IRA, also called uh, Oglock and Aaron, but no disclaimer, I'm probably going to butcher the gate of pronunciations, sorry. And this was the uh, IRA that fought the uh, War of Independence, and the first one to be called the IRA. There's also um, the Irish National Liberation Army, which is uh, kind of most closely associated with the Irish Social Working Party. There's uh, Tumon de Bon, which is the Women Auxiliary. There is the Continual IRA, the, the Provisional IRA, the Original IRA, the Real IRA, and then pretty much any group of Anglophone pipe on call themselves IRA. So pretty much there are multiple IRAs, and I'm going to also try to cover the different splits, their factions, but I can't get to all of them in detail. Okay, so history background. Pretty much the uh, history, the first part comes in back in 1169 was the first time that England and Ireland had contact. It was the Norman invasion. Uh, not much happened after this. The England invaded. They were fought back. They considered Ireland a uh, lordship and they governed it but pretty much gave free reign. They didn't really cap down too tightly on it. But really happened was in 1542 when King Henry VIII declared himself King uh, of Ireland. He, you know, was declared the self King of uh, England, Ireland, and that's where he got the United Kingdom in Ireland. He became head of the uh, Church of England. This is the first time that uh, England really became Protestant, it really became identified as Protestant, and Ireland was pretty much identifying itself as Catholic, and this is really significant because this will prop up throughout like the entire history of Ireland up until today. And next major event happened in 1605 with the gunpowder plot. Remember, remember the 6th of, uh, 5th of November, Guy Fawkes tried to blow up Parliament. At this time, the uh, English had been trying to clamp down on Catholic freedom in England, and so in order to create a sort of a revolution, Guy Fox entered Parliament and was stuck into Parliament underneath and tried to pretty much destroy it. This course failed, he was discovered, he was in the conspiracy of torture, killed, and after that there was a big clamping down on freedom for Catholics in England and this kind of spilled over to Ireland. The English were afraid that the Irish could possibly uprise, that they would uh, be counted as allies by either France or Spain. This happened before uh, the uh, Spanish Armada during Elizabeth's reign. They tried to contact Ireland for support, but it pretty much the ships were destroyed and it was lost. However, in 1641, the first time Ireland managed to have what's called the first Irish uprising and the Irish rebellion. Ireland at this point until 1649 was pretty much a free state for the first time since the conquest. Uh, in order, the response to this was in 1649 the Cromwellian conquest where Oliver Cromwell, also known as First Lord Protector of the Commonwealth of England, Scotland, Ireland, pretty much he hated Irish, he hated Catholics, so you can imagine how he felt about Irish Catholics. He, uh, England kind of wanted to punish Ireland, so they sent him over there to do his thing, which included a whole lot of burning, looting, killing, shooting. 
including deporting over uh, 50,000 Irish to Barbados and Bermuda as essentially uh, slaves. And you can actually find more about that in this uh, book specifically about this um, period called The Heller Barbados and Ethnic Cleaning of Ireland. And the first actual rebellion that was sort of across the um, religious divide happened in 1798 with uh, Theobald Wolfe Tone. And this was the uh, second time that Ireland became a free independent, but it was only for a few months. But it also, pretty much after this point, uh, Irish nationalism became much stronger. They had a case of freedom and we have the Society of United Irishmen created by Wolfe Tone. And it's significant because Wolfe Tone, who is this big Irish hero, was not Catholic, but was actually Protestant. And though he fought for a Catholic emancipation, he himself was Protestant. And you'll find that in Prolof Aaron, the big thing is religious freedom. And pretty much all of the uh, major IRA are for uh, religious freedom. And this was a big thing with Wolfe Tone as well. The next really significant event happened in 1844 with the blight, the potato famine, the great famine. Essentially, a blight killed most of the potato crop. And what is not true is that this killed all the food in Ireland. There was plenty of food in Ireland. The food was, for instance, wheat or other cash crops. However, these were on English land, like I mentioned, England invaded and had been taken up Irish lands. Well, all the cash crops were on uh, English property, so they were sold back to England. And this meant that all the Irish had left were pretty much the cheap potatoes that they couldn't sell. And when those died, many of the Irish died. Uh, the big uh, you know, effect of the famine was that it pretty much cut the Irish population in half. About uh, half of that was due to the actual death from the famine, and the rest was from immigration to uh, mostly America, United States of America, and Canada. And, and this sort of mass immigration would come into play actually pretty soon after this. So, uh, in 1858, we have what's called the Fenian Brotherhood was founded in the United States. This was uh, actually the first time that there was Irish rebellion in the U.S. itself. In 1858, the Fenians tried to actually overthrow, overthrow British Canada and use it as a ransom for Ireland. It was, of course, a big failure. They tried. They thought they could get United States support. Um, probably rely on the fact that the United States had fought two wars with England in the past revolution in 1812, but they never got the support and they were pretty much crushed and killed. But it was significant because the, the Fenian Brotherhood, while in Canada it was pretty much crushed, in the U.S. it was still alive and would provide support throughout uh, the history of the IRA later. Also the Fenian Brotherhood, also known as the Irish Republican Brotherhood, at this point even as far back as the 1860s, was conducting essentially bombing attacks in England. This is essentially the prototypical IRA. Uh, the next really big event was the founding of Sinn Féin. This uh, pretty much the most influential political party in Ireland was founded in 1905. And while it was a political party, it pretty much always had links with the, at this point, the IRA, later on when they the splits, they would be linked with the provincial Irish Republican Army. And let's see, the next uh, big event, Easter Rising in 1916. Now, while this was led and planned by the Irish Republican Brotherhood, the action was carried out by many different groups. Essentially, the Irish Republican Brotherhood uh, called uh, the Oblach Nair, the Irish Volunteers, um, Gaharda the Aaron, the Irish Citizen Army, uh, Kumla Nivan, the Women's League, as well as um, disaffected workers, uh, and pretty much anyone who had Irish Republican tendencies were kind of taken under this banner of the Irish Republican Brotherhood. And, 19, and this was the 24th of April when they seized location in Dublin and they drafted and proclaimed uh, Problox Aaron, which was the first time that uh, Ireland had declared itself a republic in pretty much since 
the uh, since what time? And let's see. The rise itself was a military failure. They were outnumbered. Unfortunately, they had at this point, 1916, World War One was going on. There was an attempt to contact Germany by members of the uh, the provisional government, the signers of the treaty. They went and talked to Germany. Germany promised to do the shipment of arms and soldiers. However, this was intercepted and it never came to fruition. So there was some confusion. Some of the leaders told that their, their factions that it was called off and they should wait. Others had told to go ahead. So what happened was in 1916, they essentially proclaimed Ireland an independent nation. They fought against the Britons, but at one outnumbered 10 to 1, they were crushed. And everyone who signed the declaration was killed, as well as many uh, soldiers, many of the members of the IRA, which at this point was still called the I Irish Republican Brotherhood. Now, the probably the biggest figure of and the most prominent would be uh, James Connolly, and I'm not going to go through every single um, individual, but kind of important is that. Uh, this is the Irish Republican movement is one that really um, lived on martyrs. It's probably their big, I mean, martyrdom is probably the biggest natural resource in Ireland. And, <laughs> and um, this might sound racist, but the Irish, and I'm Irish Catholic, so I can say it, but they're really, they're really a fatalistic people. They really, uh, James Colley himself had a big, had a point where he said, this is probably going to fail, also, we're going to do it anyway. <laughs> And it's all right. pretty much, yeah. <laughs> and uh, Connolly himself, and this is interesting because this was not, this is being more explored now, but for a large period, uh, this is kind of not as um, well known that he had uh, Marxist socialist tendencies and that he felt that uh, going back to like Bolton and, the, and before, uh, he felt that this was a way of transcending the religious divide. He said, uh, let's see, and I quote, that Marxist tendencies for the people felt, so, uh, uh, he felt that the work of, and in the work of abolishing it, the Catholic, the Protestant, the Catholic, the Jew, the Catholic, the free thinker, the Catholic, the Buddhist, the Catholic, the Mohammedan, okay, he's maybe a little biased for the Catholic here, but the point is that he believed that it was not one religious group will cooperate together for us. We have said elsewhere, socialism is neither Protestant or Catholic or Christian or free thinker or Buddhist, Muhammad and Jew is only human. So this was so Connolly was trying to bring Marxism to Ireland and also trying to he didn't want to make the IRA and we didn't want to make this like the uh, Catholic uprising. He wanted to make it for all people and a way of uh, bringing it a struggle for all of Ireland. And also the big thing is, of all the men executed, he is probably the most well known because not only was he uh, a prominent member, but the way he was executed, he was pretty much uh, dying when he was brought to the uh, prison. He was bleeding profusely, his wounds were poorly bandaged, he couldn't even, you know, he couldn't stand up. He couldn't even sit to in a chair to face the firing squad. They had to tie him to the chair. And when uh, people found out about this, they were really outraged. It seemed it made England look uh, pretty much like they were using uh, really brutal tactics. So this got a lot of support for Ireland. And this was probably the biggest, you know, um, uh, propaganda ploy was. The England's mishandling, and England had, you know, pretty much does this a lot of suppressing, which leads to support the popular movement. And uh, another kind of uh, important uh, key event, because pretty much after the uh, rising of 1916, there's not a lot until the actual War of Independence in 1919. However, there are a few. Um, uh, 
may have, there are a few other events, mostly the, uh, like the formation of the British Black and Tans, a sort of paramilitary unit to count the IRA. These were, if Britain wanted to do something without getting its hands officially dirty, they'd send the Black and Tans. Now, the French War for Independence started in January 21st, 1919. And this was a kind of series of back and forth paramilitary raid between the Irish, which now at this point were calling themselves the IRA. At modern time, we call them the old IRA to distinguish from all the other bazillion other IRAs. Back then, they were just the first one to go by IRA. And also, they were also called the Oglach Aaron, the Irish Volunteers, which also doesn't help because even now, they're like, 10 or 15 organizations also call themselves Olaf and Aaron. But at this point, uh, let's see, another sort of big event was uh, Bloody Sunday 1920, as opposed to the Bloody Sunday in the 1970s, the one that the god awful U2 song is about. <laughs> I'm not a fan of the up, sorry. This was, uh, if you've seen the movie Michael Collins, you've seen this event, you've seen it portrayed wrong. Uh, in the movie, the uh, black and tans bring a auto personnel carrier into a Gaelic League football, uh, football game and find the crowd. What happened was, after um, 11 British intelligence officers were executed by Michael Collins, uh, Britain retaliated by sending an armored personnel carrier outside of the stadium because they couldn't um, fit it inside and just kind of open fire indiscriminately uh, into the uh, through the doors, and as people ran out, they were gunned down. Pretty much like with James Connolly, this produced a lot of mortar, a lot of martyrs, a lot of support for Ireland, and it was really a pretty stupid move on Britain because the IRA ranks pretty much swelled up this, especially internationally, where England was losing a lot of support. Uh, also, another one was the execution of Kevin Barry, who was a the uh, IRA leader with Collins and what made Barry's death significant is because, first of all, his youth. He was only 18 at the time. Second, he was uh, tortured. And uh, third, he was also uh, not convicted of any crime. He was convicted of association. And at this time, Britain was executing people who were associated with the IRA or suspected of association with the IRA who looked at an IRA pretty much Britain was using this as a way of reprisal tax. So essentially, an uh, IRA member would burn down the barracks. The, of course, they had no idea who they were, so they sent the black and tan to burn down the building until they found out who they were. They can either get it out of people or just kill enough people that they assume they got the ones responsible. With the death of Kevin Barry, there was a lot of support internationally Again, another martyr, more swelling of the ranks, and it got more support. Uh, also, in 1921, so soon before, this was still in the height of the War of Independence, the Royal Ulster Stagnatory was formed. This was the pretty much the British police force that would, well, it started as, a Royal, as the Royal Irish Stagnatory until the Declaration, until England. Uh, Ireland became free or split, and then it became the Royal Ulster Conciliatory. But here, the RIC was Britain's police force in Ireland. And at this point, it was used, it was a police force, but it was used pretty much as a paramilitary group of a different name. And this would become probably the second favorite target of the IRA throughout history. Uh, then we have from June 28th, 1922 to the 23rd of May, uh, 1923, we have the, um, what's called the Kola Kahara which is the Irish Civil War, because after, this was right, it was pretty much right after the Independence War ended. Ireland um, won its independence from England, but what happened was there was the Anglo Irish Treaty, which said that the six counties in the north would be uh, under the rule of England, would still be considered British. The 26 counties in the south would be United um, Irish. And there was a big, this is the first big split in the IRA. There was on one side the 
called the Pro Treaty. These would be um, Michael Collins and what would become the Irish Army, not the Irish Republican Army, but just the Irish Army. And on the other side, the Irish Republican Army, and they fought a civil war, essentially, about whether or not they should agree to the treaty, whether or not they should keep fighting for full independence, or whether they should accept the treaty and use it as sort of a stepping stone to future um, full independence. And there was a lot of debate on either side. Some thought that they would never you know, last long enough for an outright war uh, with World War, you know, without World War II, World War One going on, Britain's uh, tension wasn't divided as much. Uh, there was a big debate, and essentially it boiled down to this uh, civil war. In the end, the uh, pro treaty side won out, and Ireland is pretty much in the same way it is today, with the northern uh, six provinces being uh, British and the southern being Irish. And uh, the, there was a split in political parties as well with Eamon de Valera, who was the third president of Ireland and also the pro, uh, pretty much the biggest anti-treaty uh, proponent. He formed Fianna Fáil, which is a, uh, a political party that opposed uh, Sinn Féin. And, let's see, in 1966, the Ulster Volunteer Force uh, let's see, and I went to an armed campaign, but what they were formed, they, they were a force of pretty much Ulstermen who were the anglo Protestants, and they were formed pretty much in retaliation to the IRA. The Ulster Volunteer Force were linked officially to England, or they operated entirely on their own. And they lasted until May 2007 when they officially announced a ceasefire. But for, from this time, from 1966 to 2007, they were pretty much uh, the Anglo-Protestant answer to the IRA. And while this group, while it's really known that this group claimed to be Irish Republican, they were primarily anti-Catholic, so it was the sectarian fighting. And one of the uh, leaders, uh, Martin Dillon, quote was saying, at the time the attitude was, if you couldn't get an Irish amen, you should get a take, a uh, term for a Catholic, he's your last resort. Now, in 1969, the IRA split into the provisional Irish Republican Army, which is the one that is most closely linked with Sinn Féin, and the official IRA. The main split was over uh, tactics, was over um, a ceasefire agreement at the time, the uh, provisional IRA, the provost, decided they thought they could uh, negotiate with England. The official IRA wanted to just continue fighting. And while, and while the provosts were active uh, from 1969 to 1997, they did have a ceasefire from 1972 to 1975. Now, in 1970, the Workers' Party of Ireland called themselves the official Sinn Féin. They, they allied with the official IRA, and another split. Now the official IRA with uh, official Sinn Féin. Next we have the Bloody Sunday Massacre, also called Boxing Massacre, 30th January 1972. This is the famous one where a uh, Irish civil rights uh, demonstration was attacked by the British Paramil uh, Paratrooper Division. What makes this significant, besides the fact that it was very well publicized besides the fact that it's well known. This is unlike before where it was like the RUC or the um, Ulster Volunteer Force. This is the actual British Army itself had open fire on civilians. And this was, of course, at a time you know, of global communication, so more people knew about it. It was very, you know, very big around the world, a lot more support for Ireland. And actually, at this point, it became um, such a to such a point that the, some of the British members of parliament were even suggesting ceding parts of Northern Ireland to the Irish as, it only, as that was the only way to um, placate the Irish and that this was you know, a solution to this really negative image. A lot of nations you know, were condemning this attack. Now, in 1974, the Irish National Liberation Army formed, allying itself with the Irish Republican Socialist Party, 
and they went back and claimed um, to get their inspiration from James Connolly. And there's actually the youth wing of this is called the Young Colonies. And this group was active, it's still active, but in terms of militarily, it declared a ceasefire in August 1998, and currently the INLA vows to use peaceful means to achieve aims. In 1981 is when we have the hunger strike of uh, uh, Bobby Sands, Francis Hughes, Reagan Creech, Patsy O'Hara, Joe McDonald, Martin Herson, Kevin Lynch, Keir Doherty, Thomas McElroy, and Michael Devine. Something significant is of these people, three of them are INLA, the rest are provosts. And the hunger strike was uh, part of a series of strikes by Irish prisoners to potentially be treated as prisoners of war. It not, might seem as a technicality, but for them it's important because it would recognize that there is a war going on. They have and claim some legitimacy. Their um, demands were that they should not be forced to wear prison uniforms, that they should be able to uh, have contact with their families, that they should have better conditions. And the biggest one is they wanted to have a um, have their leaders uh, speak with British leaders. And if you've ever seen like one of those montages of leaders of 1980s, and you've seen uh, Margaret Thatcher's "Crime is Crime is Crime," this is what she's referring to. She refused to give um, a political prison status to the hunger strikers and. Pretty much every single hunger striker of these ones mentioned died in the hunger strike. Uh, the most famous of these was Bobby Sands. And, and again, like with Connolly and Kevin Barry and all the others, this also was pretty much another example of England giving Ireland another martyr. But when Bobby Sands died, the um, outrage around the world was really significant. For instance, in the US, it made national news for weeks. There was a lot of debate. There was a lot of discussion of it. In Cuba, a memorial was erected to Bobby Sands. And this I found particularly amusing. In Iran, where the embassy of the UK located, the street of the UK embassy was renamed Bobby Sands Street. It's kind of just a really awesome take that. <laughs> uh, the uh, Rajya Sabha of uh, the Indian Parliament gave a tribute like a moment of silence. Uh, there were protests on the streets of France. There was even rioting. And in Ireland itself, of course, there was a surge of new IRA membership. So this is you know, another really big uh, pretty much recruitment drive. The, the, in 1986, the continuity IRA formed, and this was a split with um, uh, pretty much disaffected groups of Irish, other Irish Republicans. They worked with the Irish National Liberation Army. They worked together. They had similar aims. Like the continuity IRA was not as tied to the Irish Socialists. Uh, party as the INLA or the different Irish Socialist Party, because there's several like the Irish Worker Party and the Socialist Party and the Irish Social Republican Party, but the Catino IRA was never as tightly linked, but it did work with the INLA. And that goes up to 1997 when the real IRA was formed, uh, and like so many others, they also call themselves Oblak and Aaron, and the real IRA. IRA primarily was uh, formed in response to the um, dwindling attacks. For instance, the provisional IRA, uh, as well as Sinn Féin, were having more peace agreements with Britain, and these culminated in the Good Friday Agreement in 23 May 1998. So while Sinn Féin had, had got the provisional IRA to pretty much agreed to a ceasefire. Many members didn't agree to the ceasefire continued, and there were um, you know, bombings uh, in England, even you know, pretty much up to this day. One, uh, one also thing to mention 
uh, there was also this period of uh, captains. While the provisional Irish Republican Army did uh, set bombs in London, as opposed to some of the other IRAs, which preferred to work only in uh, Northern uh, Ireland, the provosts were mostly concerned with political targets such as Margaret Thatcher. They at least twice tried to assassinate Thatcher directly. One time, uh, pretty close, by placing a car bomb uh, under her car. Whereas the continuing a continuity IRA was concerned with also disruption of British infrastructure. So they were also doing sabotage. One of the most famous is the um, Hampstead Bridge on the which is a really big uh, route on the uh, London Underground, and it's been pretty much their favorite target for years. And so that pretty much brings us up to like the uh, situation where it is now, where officially the IR, the provisional IRA, most of the main Irish Republican armies, like the INLA, the Provost, the provisional Irish Republican Army, they are officially on ceasefire. Uh, Sinn Féin, has, because of their links with the Irish Republican Army, because they want to keep the legitimacy, has pretty much called for a full session to violence, session to the use of arms. However, uh, there are many groups such as the uh, Real IRA and another group that simply just called itself the IRA, trying to uh, tie itself back to the old IRA that pretty much claim that they will never stop by this until uh, England has given up their claim to Ireland is united. So, and pretty much for what I'm talking about, the IRA, I'm pretty sure any, any paramilitary organization that seeks the goal of United Ireland. So really, uh, the tactics are different, but mostly every single one of these groups has the same goal of a united Irish Republic. They're just the tax is different. So while the, I, the INLA and the Provo, the Provisional Irish Republic Army, are seeking more peaceful means now, and other groups are seeking more military, the one linking um, aspect is that they all seek to have a united Ireland. OK, and so I kind of bring this up to modern times. So are there any uh, questions? Okay. So, given your history, it's pretty fair to say that the characterization of the problems in Ireland uh -huh. as a religious war are pretty much false. Because isn't it the case that almost all of the IRAs, with only a few exceptions, um, are secular? Which is, it's not about Protestant or Catholic, but it's about national liberation? Pretty much. One problem, and what kind of makes it sticky, is that in Ireland, religion and ethnicity are almost are very similar. It's very much a part of culture, kind of like if you say, you know, someone, it's like Arab Muslim and Jewish Jew. I mean, it's part of their identity. And just a anecdote, well, last semester, um, a classmate of mine mentioned her son was serving a mission to Ireland and mentioned people who identify themselves as Catholic Mormon or Protestant Mormon, meaning that they, that's where they converted from. So Catholic or Protestant, it's not, I mean, it's not even about religion as much as identity, and that's the big thing, is, is cultural identity. I mean, many of the people who identify themselves as Catholic or Protestant aren't even religious as much as that's who they are. That's kind of their own culture. Um, I mean, part of the main reason why England through, uh, I don't briefly touch on this, the penal laws throughout the history of the conquest tried to suppress the church, the Catholic church, was as a way of cultural imperialism, suppressing the church and suppressing the language. It was cultural imperialism. It wasn't a big thing about, it wasn't a theological debate. It was a cultural issue. But yeah, you're right. It's not a, they don't really care you know, whether or not you believe in the Pope or not. It's just a matter of this group and that group. So it's more of identity and cultural identity than it is um, theological or sectarian debate. So it's more like, it's like, are you for the, are you for the complete uh, removal of the English? He's like, yeah. It's like, all right, well, then Catholic enough for me. Yeah, it, <laughs> pretty, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's like the direction goes the other way. Exactly. <laughs>
Yeah. My question is, um, is there a possibility of Northern Ireland becoming Ireland, a part of Ireland? Is, is, it, is it an actual possibility that Britain will release their hold on that six countries, or six counties? It's much less uh, possible now than before, but it still is possible. Uh, there's still a much um, greater amount, there's still a greater amount of people in the Northern Ireland that wants to be part of Ireland. However, uh, it's unlikely that Britain would release that because there still is a group of uh, Anglo-Irish who now are considering themselves to be just, you know, their, they, their um, side, you know, to be fair, they felt that they've lived there, you know, you know, 10 generations that, you know, they, didn't, they aren't the ones who invaded Ireland, they're just living there now. So why should, you know, they give up their property? Why should they give up their, you know, uh, culture, their rule? And the big thing is they consider themselves to be Anglo-Irish, so they want to kind of have this sort of dual nationality. They want, they consider themselves uh, Irish and they have since themselves already claimed to Ireland, but they still want to be ruled by England and still want to have that English connection. So it's unlikely that England would ever, you know, abandon them or that they would willingly go back to England. They were pretty much settled there and uh, one thing that was argued during the whole treaty a debate was that the only way they could, you know, achieve these means is through uh, violence, through force, and that's kind of a big date. Um, reason why the IRA separated, you know, so many times is, you know, at these different junctures, at these different courts, whether or not you can achieve it through peaceful means or through military means. Yeah. Um, is there any economic benefit to owning those six countries? It seems. Kind of insignificant for Britain to defend a colony of good people when they're still opening fire on, on citizens. It seems there seems to be something more than just taking care of their own good citizens. Yeah, there's not not particularly. I mean, it is of course the more property you own, you know, there is an advantage to it. But there's nothing. I mean, there's no like oil reserves. There's no gold mines. Nothing you know really significant. In one of these counties that the English really, really need. It's more of, uh, first, of course, there is the national pride, there is sort of this sense of nationalism, but also these people, the, the um, uh, Anglo uh, Irish, consider that this place is part of England, and so the, essentially, it's the people who live here. Uh, they consider themselves as having a legitimate claim to this uh, location, and they will defend it. And England, of course, considers them British citizens, and so will defend them. So it's, yeah, it's not economic, it's pretty much all political. Yeah. Could you say that it's almost like, uh, like Israel and Palestine? Basically, the Palestinians, you have the Arabs already there, and then you have these Jews that claim that that's their homeland, and so they just go back to that, and so that's where it comes from. Oh, Could it be similar to that, at least? Very, very similar, actually. In fact, there are there's a famous mural that says, Now Entering Free Dairy, which is a um, uh, reference to you know the free island. And there's also a mural that's exactly the same, Now Entering Free Palestine. And there's like a big uh, attempt on both some of the Irish and some of the Palestinians to make a connection there. And of course there's also on both sides uh, or, you know, trying to claim that uh, essentially that they have a connection with the other. So the Irish and the Palestinians, but also sometimes the Irish are identifying with, for instance, the Israelites as uh, having a, uh, as a Jew, that have a claim to this area. So. While it's not exactly one to one, not like it's oversimplification to say that the Irish always are going to sympathize with the Palestinians. However, the debate over who legitimately owns and has a right to this property and governing governance of this property that is a debate which is very much um, analogous. Yeah. 
So do you see the main likelihood of the six counties being returned being the overthrow of the UK government? That would be preferable, yeah. Um, <laughs> is it likely? Uh, I think it might be possible through other means, but it is quite probably not, not, not going to happen peaceably. It could happen through a military uprising in Northern Ireland that we can't predict right now. Perhaps the IRAs will you know, rearm, will become remilitarized, will become much more aggressive, and we can see another overthrow. But it's unlikely, but we just don't see the same type of nationalistic push that we did you know, 100 years ago. I also wouldn't count the uh, great uh, the Socialist Party, the Great Britain Socialist Party, is what it is, but they're Marxist yeah. the Socialist Party. Oh, yeah. But I mean, just recently they had a, a, um, a parade in Britain uh, celebrating Ireland. Yeah, that's also true. That um, not to be too you know, not to talk just about Ireland, but there are other Socialist parties that the Irish, the Irish Socialist Party, and also the other Irish parties. So even Sinn Fein, other Irish parties that are not. Socialists have making overtures to, such as the <coughs> Socialist Party in England, as well as uh, in at, at the time at Russia, um, it was rumored but unsubstantiated that uh, Lenin and Connolly were great um, admirers of each other. So it's not substantiated, but there are a lot of people who do make that claim, and people who know. Then he said that he was, he um, mourned uh, Connolly's death and wished he could meet him. So they did have contact with other uh, socialist parties, and there, yeah, there could be a uh, probability of that there will be uh, support from these parties. Yeah. yeah one last question. Um, okay. Would it be feasible to suggest that if Scotland mm -hmm. gets its entire freedom mm -hmm. from Britain, that Britain will have to, well, from England, and then they will have to release also Northern Ireland because they cannot have control over it. Would that be feasible because they are losing power over the Scottish people? They're right. giving power to the Scottish Parliament now and giving them more and more rights to their own government. So. Right, and actually, that could be possible. It could be even something similar to that. For instance, one thing that, now, like I said, you know, every time England is really good at cracking down and then suffering major rebellion, they've also had instances like with Scotland where they realized that they're not going to get these violent uprisings if they grant more and more autonomy. So Scotland is gradually becoming more and more autonomous. I'm not sure if it'll ever be like before completely free. However. We are seeing this slightly in Ireland. Um, in Northern Ireland, of course, the Irish have their own parliament. There is some measure of home rule in Northern Ireland. And there has been throughout history, it's kind of gone in ways. They've enacted harsh laws, they repealed them, and after they repealed them. So there is a possibility that uh, Northern Ireland could become almost like you know, Canada. It could be a situation where it might still technically owe allegiance to England as a figurehead, which might be enough that the you know, Irish Republicans could stomach, but essentially be independent in terms of its own government. Now, whether or not this could result in United Ireland, because this is another thing, the Irish the concept of republicanism in this term is of a free and united Ireland. It's not just that they want the North to be free as its own separate country, but they want it to be able to rejoin. They don't want to see the essentially the North become like a still a puppet state. They don't want it to be like any way, shape, or form controlled by England, even if it's only in name. They want it to rejoin essentially Ireland and become its own country. Well, I want to thank you, Matt, for giving us this lecture on the IRA.